God, help us to continue to not just sing empty words, but to walk it out. God, we understand that sometimes what we see makes it hard to believe. But God, we're not believing in a miracle. We need to grow our faith in believing in you. God, help us to say, I will trust you, not my situation. I will trust you, not my circumstance. God, be God. Help us experience your love like never before. And in that, we'll experience your grace and your mercy, your peace. It's in Christ's name I pray. Everyone said, amen. I get real amped with worship, man. Like, I'm going to be a truth moment. I had like this real cry moment in the back where I felt like God just like laid on me literally and just hugged me. Because sometimes I feel like I'm under attack. Too many distractions, things trying to get me off. And they're like, well, this is going wrong. This didn't click. But in that moment, God says, hold up, wait, wait, wait. If you'll get in this worship moment, you'll forget about that. You'll start to feel that love that you didn't feel this morning when you walked out the house and everybody was still asleep. You'll start to feel that peace when you got that text message about something else that's gone wrong. You'll start to experience me. And when you experience me, you'll find fullness of joy. That's why we love to have worship here. We're going to gather together around God's word. And we're going to get around worship at the end. Because this hour right here is an impactful hour, but it does us no good if you don't experience God's love and take it with you for the rest of the week. So we believe that what happens in this hour will impact however somebody do the math, how many other hours you got in a week. But don't let it just die here. You take your worship experience with you at home. God wants to meet you in your car. God wants to meet you on your job. God wants to meet you in the bathroom. That's your private place, but God is everywhere. Hallelujah. But if you expect it, He'll meet you there. I want to go ahead and jump into my scripture this week as I tackle the topic of intentions versus obedience. And I'm reading from Genesis 22, and it reads this way. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much. And go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son, Isaac. Then he chopped wood for fire and a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up. And saw the place in the distance. Then he said to the servants, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there and worship. And then we will come back to you. Abraham made Isaac carry the wood for the sacrifice. And he himself carried a knife and live coals for starting the fire. As they walked along together. Isaac said, father. He answered, yes, my son. I see that you have the coals and the wood. But where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Abraham answered, God himself will provide. And the two of them walked on. God, I come to you right now. You guide my heart, guide my tongue, guide my words. You lead, I'll follow. You do what you want to do in this moment. And we'll give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Question. Um, have any of you ever gotten or received a terrible gift? Like a really, really, really bad, horrible gift? Um, like some of y'all are like, yeah, he just gave it to me this past Christmas. Yeah, I know. Don't, don't look straight. Look straight. Look straight. Right here, right here, right here. I remember a time, many of you guys know, uh, I'm from Alabama. And in Alabama, I love football, but I am an Auburn fan. I love Auburn. But one year for Christmas, I really wanted a football jacket. Now, here's the thing. Uh, I didn't think I had to be specific. But um, 
Here, I, I have, I, God blessed me with two grandmothers, two awesome grandmothers. They loved Jesus. They made me read the Bible a whole bunch. They were great. Here's the thing. One of my grandmothers was horrible at giving gifts. Um, love her, but uh, every Christmas she gave us socks and drawers. Oh, sorry, drawers. Uh, underwear. Sorry. Um, but they ain't got like no name brand. It just says shirt. And you had the socks that came way up here with the extra band. Horrible. Junk you don't even want to wear under your clothes. But every year she would give me that. Now, my birthday is December 26th, the day after Christmas. Yeah, that's still, yeah, yeah. Uh, feel bad for me, please. And so on top of my socks and drawers, she would give me a $5 bill every year. Say, so happy birthday, baby. But this one year, she decided she's going to give me an extra present. So we're leaving her home on Christmas Day. And she goes, hey, Trey, wait, wait, wait. I got a gift for you for your birthday. And I'm thinking, it's, oh, Grandma, my $5. Thank you so much. Um, she's like, no, no, no. It's in the living room on the sofa. Oh, okay. And I go into the living room, and there's this big box. And I open this big box. And in this big old box is this red, horrible looking, disgusting Alabama jacket. Let me tell you how much I don't like them. I'd rather pour lemon juice in my eyes than to watch them win. So at that moment, my mom looks in the box and she gives me the most black mama speech that I've ever heard in my life. But here's the thing about this speech. It has no words. It's just a look. She looks at me, and this look is saying, boy, you better not embarrass me or your grandmama. You better take that dog old jacket, go home, and shut your mouth, or I'm going to give you a whooping. All with her eyes. And I look back at her with my own look. And basically said with my eyes, I'll take the whooping. And walked off. Now, now here's the thing. Uh, many years later, after I got married, uh, my grandmother gave me a wedding gift. And she actually gave me a good gift for my wedding. Thank you, Grandma. Uh, and, and so what happened, we began there, and I said, Grandma, this is a great gift, finally. And she began to chuckle. And I said, Grandma, you remember the worst gift you ever gave me? She said, sure do, baby. I really do. I said, Grandma, what's the worst gift? you ever gave me. She said, it was that Alabama jacket 20-something years ago. And I said, now, here's the thing, Grandma. Um, why did you give me that jacket? She said, well, honestly, baby, uh, I really didn't care. Uh, somebody gave it to me, and I just need to get rid of it. <laughs> and then she followed up with the craziest phrase. You're lucky you got anything. Now, now, here's the thing. Uh, when it comes to giving gifts, I believe that gifts represent two things. Uh, one, I believe that a gift kind of reflects how well we know the person. Like, if I give you a gift, I should know you on some level, and that will determine the gift I give to you. But it also shows how I feel about you and how I value the person. See, I believe that in any relationship, whether it be a romantic relationship, whether it be a friend relationship, however you relate to anybody, how well you know them is key to whether or not that relationship will flourish. But to find that out is going to take time. And sometimes what happens, rather than find out how these people, how they work and how they operate, we just say, look, you're just glad, you better be glad I gave you anything. It's going to take time to get to know them. One of the, the authors, anytime I talk to a couple before they get married, I tell them there's this book they should read called The Five Love Languages. And The Five Love Languages basically says that how you perceive love may be different how that person receives love. And so in order for your relationship to function in the best way, it is key that you understand how they receive love so you can properly communicate it to them. Oftentimes, we don't want to do that. That's too much work. So we say you can take what you get, 
And then we find ourselves in these relationships that get boring and mundane and stale and not as interesting. That baby is tracking with me. We here, baby. And so, therefore, we have a relationship that begins to seem unfulfilled. And the reason why that relationship is unfulfilled is because when we decide not to value how that other person interprets love, we're just being selfish. Now, now, now here's the thing. We can talk about that in our regular relationships, which we should be better. But unfortunately, we do that in our faith relationship with God. See, what I've come to learn is that if I attempt to interact with God outside of his love language, then my faith is selfish. Now, we don't want to say that. We don't want to admit that. But oftentimes, we live a life that says to God, hey, God, you should be grateful I gave you anything. But that's not how it operates. And what will begin to happen is if we love God in an unfulfilled way or improper way, we find ourselves in an unfulfilled, boring, stale faith walk. The passion is gone. The thrill is gone. We can actually sit and have an attitude with our relationship toward God as if he no longer meets my needs. Now, he's God, so he's always right. If something's wrong, then we need to adjust. We have to love God in his love language, and it's properly laid out in John 14, very simple. It says, if you love me, obey my commandments. Ding, ding. What I'm learning is this. God's love language is obedience. Now, now here's the problem. We, we, I'm, listen, I be me. Okay. I sometimes struggle with obedience because to obey, that's a kid word. Children obey. I'm grown. I'm, I'm free. Grace says I'm free in Jesus. I do whatever I want. I think sometimes we have a weird, messed up idea of obedience as if obedience is a restriction. If God is trying to keep us from something, God trying to stop my fun. Here's the thing. Scripture says that Jesus was sent. His whole purpose was coming was so that we could have a full, fulfilling life. Even in Scripture, it says that if the world can give good gifts to their children, how much more does God want to give to you? So maybe the problem is not our idea of God keeping something good from us. Maybe our idea of good is calling us to settle and miss out on God's best. We'd rather hold on to our idea and forfeit God's version of better. Let me go back to this text because one of the things I need to say off the top is obedience is costly. If you go back to this story, it says Abraham has hears from God. And God says to Abraham, I want you to go and sacrifice your son Isaac. He's oddly specific. He says, Isaac, the, your only son, the one you love. But let me help you out in case you have forgotten. Technically, Isaac has two kids. He has another son named Ishmael that he sent away. And then he has Isaac. Now, now here's the thing, because God says, I want the one you love. If I was in Abraham's shoes and he says, I need you to sacrifice your son, I'd be like, wait, God, Ishmael, come back here. I'm not saying he didn't love Ishmael, but he didn't love him that much. That's why he sent him away. So, at best, he loves Isaac. He likes Ishmael. And so, oftentimes, what I'm finding is God will ask us stuff, and we say, okay, God, here, let you, let me have, you can have what I like, but let me hold on to what I love. But God says, no, 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 no. That's the one I want. Now, mind you, catch this. God has given Abraham a promise, and God had even prophesied or told him ahead of time that Isaac is coming. Isaac is the blessing. Isaac was a blessing. But God said, hey, that blessing that I gave to you, I want it back. Here's what I learned. 
that the blessings of God are to be managed, not owned. Like if, if God gives you something, he gets to decide how it's used. We can enjoy it. But he owns it. I think about it like a rental car. I travel quite a bit, and I love to get a rental car like, like a really, like, if I drive this, I need to rent this so I can floss a little bit. And, and, and I, I, I love it. I love it. Love it. Here's the thing. I can get in that rental car. I can drive around that rental car. I can change the station. I can adjust the seats. I can do everything in that rental car. It get me point A to point B. But Enterprise says they want it back. I have to give it back. I can enjoy it, but they own it. The reason God has to do this, he wants us to enjoy his blessings, but we can't get to a place where we love his blessings. Here's why. If we do that, we'll get to a place where we love and worship the blessing and, ex and then eliminate or forget about the blesser. So if God gives you something, how you manage it is what qualifies you to get another one. If I go and wreck an enterprise car, I can't go back and get another one because I didn't treat it properly. It's how I handle the blessing of God that qualifies me to get another blessing. So God says to him, I want you to sacrifice your son. And it says that he got up early. Notice what he did not do after he heard God's voice. He didn't pray. He didn't fast. I would have said, well, God, I need to go on a 30-day fast to make sure I heard you clearly. Isn't it weird how when God asks us to do something, we get patient. But when we pray, we want God to move quick, fast, and in a hurry. Like, God, I need it now. I need it suddenly, quick. Hey, I need you to do this. Mm. <laughs> Patience is a virtue. I don't want to rush. Hold on. Hold on, Lord. Hold on. But that's not what he did. He got up early. He moved. See, what I have to understand is it's obedience to God that leads to the blessing. Movement is key. God says, hey, I want you to go to this place, Mount Moriah. Three days, they still hadn't gotten there yet. But it was the obedience of going to where God told him how long it was going to take him that he saw the blessing. See, one of the things I've come to understand is that it's obedience that sets the path. Obedience sets the pace to God's provision. The scripture said that as they were walking, Isaac said, hey, dad, where, where, where's the lamb? And he said, God will provide. Did he have a lamb yet? No. And it says they kept walking. See, oftentimes I find it easier to walk if I already had a lamb. Oh, then I can walk. How, Lord, how far you want me to go? Give me the land right now. We can, we can walk together. Amen. But the provision is on the other side of obedience. Notice this. He says, I want you to go to Mount Moriah. That was that three days I hadn't gotten there yet. Oftentimes I was thinking, well, God, ain't there a closer mountain? We're in a mountainous range. There's mountain peaks everywhere. Let me go to this mountain and then I sacrifice him. But understand something. The ram that was the provision was at that mountain. So think about this. Help me help. Let me help you out. He could have sacrificed Isaac and been wrong. He would have missed the blessing and lost his son because the provision was in the going. See, oftentimes, here's the thing. I believe that we, on the, for the most part, have the best of intentions when it comes to serving God. We want to serve God. We want to love God. We want to be all those things. But sometimes serving God is inconvenient. So what we say is, okay, God, I want to be obedient, but I want to hold on to my convenience. The only thing no two things have in common is a couple letters at the end. They are completely opposite. Serving God will never be found in convenience. I think of it like this. You have your, your intentions on one side, and there's this gulf. And on the other side is obedience. But in the middle of our intentions, that's where I'm at. That's, that's me. That's myself. What's in my gulf? My pride is in my gulf. My insecurities are in my gulf. My skills are in my gulf. 
but my shortcomings are in my gulf. And what begins to happen is all of that me gets in the way of my intentions, and my intentions enter this gulf, and they all die in a pool of lies. And I never become obedient, which is what he's asking for. Even sometimes what I realize is God can ask us to do small things, but there's sometimes those small things that are hard. So we'll say, hey, God, let me give you a spiritual exchange. Let me do something else that's spiritual and maybe you'll like it. Okay, uh, uh, you want me to tithe? God, I'll give you 15%, but I'm not going to apologize to my wife. God, you want me to end this relationship that doesn't bring you glory because I want to serve you. How about this? I'll serve every service. They can go to seven services. I'm there, God. I'll give you my Sunday, but let me be me Monday through Saturday. As if God is going to be like, oh, I'm distracted by the fireworks of your serving that I'm going to miss that little thing you're doing over here. That's not what I asked you to do. I don't care if God asks you to do one thing and you think I can do 25 things, the balance still doesn't work. Scripture said it this way. What is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Obedience is better than sacrifice. And submission is better than offering the fat of the lambs. See, we have to understand something. It is completely possible to do a good thing for bad reasons. It's completely possible to do the right thing for the wrong reasons. God is more concerned with the why you do something than the what. God is asking us to do some more, but unfortunately, we can't allow ourselves to get in way of what God is asking you to do. Yeah, nobody intends to mess up. But guess what? We start to compromise. And we'll be like, well, God, just take what I give you. And he's saying that's not what I asked for. The scripture says that they kept walking without a lamb. They got to the mountain. And he ties Isaac up. He puts him on the altar. He draws his knife. And it's when he drew the knife, the angel of the Lord stopped him. And the scripture says it this way. God responded, because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that what? I will bless you. Obedience is the precursor to the blessing. See, here's the thing. God is constantly asking us to do things. And we're like, uh, that's too big. Hey, 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 God, I, I can't leave that because we're afraid and we're fearful of what it will cost us. I remember a couple weeks ago when Rob talked about our top five. And I began to think about, ooh, I do spend a lot of time time with that person but that's my 76's tickets whoa hold on lord <laughs> like 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 god look wait, hey lord um mm. and what we begin to live a life is that we begin to assume that if i give something up that god is going to leave a void in my life think about that god is going to be a void in my life or is it maybe that the place where god wants me to experience this fullness is an act of obedience. See, here's the thing. Let me, let me show you, especially with relationships. I've been hearing about relationships all week long. You're afraid that if I let this go, I won't get nothing. Let me help you out. God can't give you something if your hands are already full. God is setting up things. And so you're like, what's my small step? Good, I'm glad you asked, especially this week. You don't, you feel lonely? Your small step, you ain't even got to walk three days. You just got to walk outside to the lobby. Go to a table where you can encounter some believing people who want to build you up and get a better grade of friends. Look at all them bees I just threw in there. God is saying, hey, I'm not trying to keep you from something. I'm trying to get you to something. 
But if you don't trust me enough, you're going to die without it. You're going to sacrifice your good for my better. And then we, because we don't trust God, we have this unfulfilled, no passion, no drive to love him. But once you get that provision, once you encounter him, you have no choice but to fall deeply and madly in love with him. But it's on the other side of obedience. Will you begin to take your next step? And here's the thing. I love this. One of the things we can look at Abraham and we can see this moment. But guess what? This was the first time he failed. He succeeded this time. But there's three other times before where he did not obey. And God gave him another shot. Here's my challenge to you. You didn't obey yesterday, but what about today? You messed up this morning, but what about right now? That the beauty of faith that in all of this is that there is never a period. You can do it over again. You can go on this path, and you've chosen this path. And here's the thing. Some of us are functioning in this path, but it's dysfunctional. And what we want you to understand is there is more, there is better, but it is on the other side of you being obedient. And it's how you handle the obedience that qualifies you. Take your step. Do the small thing. Because small steps lead to great blessings. God, we love you. God, we praise you. God, we honor you. God, we adore you. God, let these not be empty words. God, help me to obey you more. Grow my love for you. Grow my heart towards you. Help me be who you would have me to be. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.